Welcome to Orbital Dynamics. This is a multi-part course on the basics of orbital dynamics. The Orbital Dynamics or Orbital Mechanics textbooks assume familiarity with calculus and all the algebra and trig that goes along with that. They also assume familiarity with physics, mechanics primarily. I learned orbital dynamics well after college and didn't remember any of my math, college math or physics. I had to relearn the basics and out of that develop this course. In this course, I go over all the math and physics you'll need to comprehend the more advanced concepts. None of this is very complicated, and even when it is, I try to present the material in an accessible way with lots of animations. I take you through all the algebraic steps in the mathematical derivations, and unlike the textbooks, which have to conserve space, I don't skip steps. You can get a lot out of this course if you just listen to the lectures. However, if you really want to learn the material, I recommend you do your own calculations and do the algebraic derivations yourself. Along the way, I'll teach you how to do the calculations and will introduce you to the tools I use to develop this course. I teach a lot of history in this course. If you understand the foundational discoveries behind the laws of physics and mathematical formalisms, you get a better intuition for how the math and physics work. I start with the ancient Greeks and go forward in time to Kepler, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, and beyond. Most of the foundations of orbital dynamics involves physics and astrophysics, so I touch on astronomy as well. This course is called orbital dynamics as opposed to orbital mechanics. The terms are synonymous in the way we use them. Mechanics is the branch of applied math that deals with motion and forces producing motion. Dynamics is a branch of mechanics concerned with motion of bodies under the action of forces. The other part of mechanics is statics, which is the branch of mechanics concerned with bodies at rest and forces in equilibrium. This course deals mostly with dynamics and a bit with statics. Orbiting bodies, at least the interesting parts, are dynamic systems. The key discoveries that led to the theories of orbital motion started with the study of orbiting planets. Ancient astronomers noticed that certain lights, as they called them, moved across the sky differently from stars. This animation is the path of Mars against a stellar background from mid-October 1996 to late July 1997. Stars move east to west as the Earth rotates. This is what they look like in the night sky, sped up considerably. There were five other objects that also went east to west in the night sky, but against the stellar background, they tended to travel eastward, then westward, then eastward. Like I showed you before, this is Mars plotted against the stellar background. It travels across the night sky from east to west with the rest of the stars. But if you look closely, it moves slightly eastward. At some point, it drifts slightly in the opposite direction, westward, and then it goes eastward again. The Greeks called these lights wanderers or by their Greek name, planetoi. That's how the word planet was derived. There are five planets that can be seen by the naked eye, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uranus can be seen if you know where to look, but it doesn't move that much against the stellar background. It was missed by the ancients. Astronomers like Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler studied the motions of planets and from that developed theories that explain their motions. This is where orbital dynamics got its start. In this animation, I'm showing motions of Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury relative to the Sun. This is how we understand these motions today, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. It took the ancients thousands of years to work out this motion. Planets orbit naturally. The study of orbital dynamics enables us to understand how they orbit. If that's all orbital dynamics was meant for, it would be part of astronomy. Isaac Newton realized that an artificial satellite could be put into orbit around the Earth. As this animation shows, if you throw a rock fast enough, it will circle the Earth endlessly. Much of what we use orbital dynamics for deals with man-made satellites. The pictures on the right are man-made satellites. Sputnik on the top, the first man-made satellite to orbit the Earth, and the International Space Station on the bottom. Probably the biggest thing we've ever put in orbit. Here's a movie by Stuart Gray that depicts the number of satellites orbiting the Earth from 1957, when the first satellite was launched, to 2015. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first man-made satellite put into Earth orbit. 
Back then, there were only 48 U.S. states. Eisenhower was president. And before it was launched, there were no man-made objects in space. In 1958, the U.S. launched its own satellite, Vanguard 1, and it's still up there. Since 1957, 30,000 objects have been launched. There's now about 20,000 objects larger than 10 centimeters still in orbit, and about 3,000 are operational. This depicts graphically how many man-made objects orbit the Earth. The dots, however, are not in proper perspective. If they were their actual if they were their actual relative size, you wouldn't see them. While there's a lot of stuff in orbit, it's all very small relative to the Earth. Why send satellites into space? Space offers a unique perspective at high altitudes, and you're above the atmosphere, which has certain advantages. This is a map of the electromagnetic spectrum. Much of what's done in space involves transmitting or receiving electromagnetic energy. The radio frequency part of the electromagnetic spectrum is in the area depicted by the red line I just drew. These frequencies pass almost transparently through the atmosphere. These are the frequencies used for communications. Space is an excellent place for worldwide communications. This is most of what's done by satellites in space. There are parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are blocked by the atmosphere. That's shown in these regions. Looking from the Earth out into space, you can't see infrared radiation very well. Same goes with X-rays. We place satellites above the atmosphere so we can see these parts of the, the electromagnetic spectrum that get blocked by the atmosphere. At these frequencies, we can learn a lot about the universe. Space-based sensors looking inward can send energy in and measure what is reflected back. Because the chemical composition of the atmosphere blocks part of the, elect of the electromagnetic spectrum, these satellites can sense the composition of the atmosphere. Here are a few examples of satellites that operate above the atmosphere. The Chandra X-ray Observatory and Hubble Space Telescope infrared sensors enable the discovery of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Ground-based telescopes couldn't have done that. Infrared radiation doesn't penetrate our atmosphere. The new James Webb Space Telescope will operate mainly in the infrared spectrum. It will be able to see the distant edge of the universe within 400 million of a 13.8 billion life of the universe. Probes can travel well beyond Earth orbit to get a closer look at planets, comets, and distant celestial objects. Ground telescopes could never see the kind of detail these probes collect. Here are before and after images of Pluto and its moon Charon. The left was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. The right was taken with the NASA New Horizons spacecraft in 2015. New Horizons got 12,472 kilometers from the surface of Pluto. Let's go back to prehistoric times. People then were familiar with the sun, the moon, and the stars. The stars moved across the night sky. The sun and moon rose and set every day, but at different times. These are the first observations that, while intuitive today, ultimately led to the discoveries that resulted in the formalisms of orbital dynamics. Things were in motion in the heavens. That inspired astronomers and physicists to try to measure and characterize these motions. There's no written record of this, but it wouldn't be that far-fetched to believe that ancient peoples thought that the sun went out each night and before it rose in the morning, some god rekindled the fire. Today we know this isn't true. The sun that rises each morning is the same sun that rose the day before. It's conceivable that the first astronomical discovery was that the big bright thing in the sky that came up each morning and set each evening and then came up the next day was the same thing. The moon goes through phases. Ancient people who kept records realized they cycled every 29 to 30 days, 29.53 days to be exact. The phases of the moon are caused by its proximity with both the Earth and the Sun. Ancient astronomers didn't realize this for many years. Those who live away from the equator would have observed dramatic seasonal changes. Those close to the equator, less so. People in higher latitudes, for people in higher latitudes, life adapted in a yearly rhythm with the cycle of the seasons. Those who are keeping good records realize that the cycle repeats every 365 days or 365.242 to be exact. 
The cleverer ones developed systems for predicting the timing of the seasons, which was a big aid to agriculture. Stars appeared to the ancients and even to us as a projection on a celestial sphere, with the stars fixed and the earth rotating within. Within the celestial sphere, stars were grouped into constellations, each representing a portion of the sky. Star patterns in the constellations were associated with shapes like a fish for Pisces, a hunter for Orion, or a crab for Cancer. In 1922, Henry Norris Russell helped the International Astronomical Union in organizing the celestial sphere into 88 official constellations that account for every star. Ancient astronomers noticed that the constellations shifted over the yearly cycle. At times, some weren't visible. The sun gets in the way and obstructs a different part of the celestial sphere during various times of the year. After the sun and the moon, Venus is the brightest object in the sky. It was popularly thought to be two separate stars, Phosphorus in the morning and Hesperus in the evening. Pythagoras was an Ionian Greek philosopher and mathematician, best known for the Pythagorean theorem. He was also one of the first to realize that the bright evening star was the same as the bright morning star. While Pythagoras put this theory forward, it took thousands of years to confirm it. Many remained steadfast in their belief that Venus in the morning and Venus in the evening were two separate stars. By the way, if you see Venus in the morning, you'll never see it in the evening and vice versa. That's what gave Pythagoras a clue that these two were the same star. Three ancient Pythagorean Greeks proposed that the motion of the stars was apparent, that it was created by the rotation of the Earth on an axis. This contradicted the model that many believed that the Earth was fixed. Many who disputed a rotating Earth asked, if the Earth spun on an axis, why don't objects fly off? Why don't we feel the spin? Why aren't there massive winds all the time? We know today that the rotation of the Earth, while measurable, is too subtle for us to feel. The jet stream blows winds from west to east. If the ancients had gone high enough, they would have known this. On the surface of our planet, there's friction. We either feel a light breeze or still air. It only occasionally gets windy. We don't fly off a spinning Earth because of a combination of momentum and gravity. If the Earth spun faster, we'd likely fly off, but it would have to be very fast. From this section, we've learned that the stars move across the sky from east to west. The Earth spins with a kind of, within a kind of celestial sphere. The seasons change over the year. The moon goes through phases. Five apparent stars move against a stellar background. The sun that rises today is the same one that rose yesterday. And that the morning and evening stars are in fact one star. These are some of the key discoveries